Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage. Today's clip is part one of a three-part interview we did with multi-instrumentalist, probably best known for his bass guitar playing Kenny Passarelli, as well as vocals. And maybe my all-time favorite pop record producer would be James William Gursio. Uh, like I told James, I, I, I almost stared in a hole through all the Chicago records that he produced as well as my favorite Blood, Sweat, and Tears album. Hope you enjoy it. If you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Once again, Kenny Passarelli with James William Garcia. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame backstage. I'm really lucky today to have Kenny Passarelli, bass player on way too many hits, and someone that um, I never really knew who a producer was until I was a huge Blood, Sweat, and Tears Chicago fan, and, and you did my favorite Blood, Sweat, and Tears album, but well, James you. William Gersio, and uh, I'm you, a bass player too. And you're I know you're a bass player. <laughs> and, and actually played bass on some of the Chicago stuff yeah. as well. But but you made you started in Chicago, you were obsession bass player, right? At least ways that's what yeah, I was. James I actually played guitar in uh, in in Chicago. And Kyle told me that you were a really great bass player and was working at Chess. Chess, yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't but I actually yeah, I did a couple of records there. Yeah. I did a few records, and then <laughs> but you, I was very, this was when I'm 15, 16. Really? And I got 10 bucks, and they'd bring in a, bring in a chart. They have an idea. It was Mercury Records mostly, not, but it was, we used chess. But I'm going to tell you how, how excited I was to be in a recording studio. It was 10 bucks, and then if I heard it on the radio, I could call and they'd send me another 25. Well, That's how wow. I started. So I did a really long interview with James Panko. I saw some of it. And, yeah. and he was saying that... Very um, talented guy, but I'm, I'm interested because he's younger than me. Well, he was... Uh, he was we went to DePaul together. Yeah, that's, that's what he told me. Him. He said he was very complimentary. He said you're yeah. a very talented player. And well, Jimmy's a very talented guy. Oh, I wanted man, him Jimmy's to write a great films. writer. I wanted him to... Uh, uh, in terms of horns, he could orchestrate like that. I, I, I thought the I think guy's he's maybe great, the best. I wanted I him to do. I wanted him to go symphonic. Plus, a so great songwriter, not to oh, mention oh, absolutely. You know, but um, tremendous writer. So he was t saying that they that they invited you to come hear them. I think it was Walter had was friends with Walt you. And I, Walt and Walt and. and, yeah. and uh, so he went to hear him play, and he said it was, they actually pulled, dropped the chicken wire in front of the stage that night because they were throwing chicken wings and bottles at them. Barnaby's. But, Barnaby's, right? That's and he said Barnaby's. But, but he said we had to keep playing our original stuff so that you could, so that you could, yeah. could hear what they. They didn't want to hear the originals, right? And I and I said I just want to hear the originals. Yeah. He said, but, but they made it through the night, and then you you said, okay, look. We're doing it. We'll yeah. go to California, basically. Yeah. yeah. And so. How did you find the house? I mean, did I mean how did well, I? Oh, he told you all that story. Yeah, yeah. I had uh, there was three bands that came from Chicago, but the primary one was CTA. That's the bus I used to take to school because mm -hmm. they were called the Big Thing. Right. I said the Big Thing. And I, <laughs> In Buckingham's, right? Was that what you No, they I was uh, the Buckingham's happened before that. But you you founded them or you produced them too. No, right? my cousin. They had uh, a kind of a drag was never released. They were on USA Records, and uh, that was my first session. That was the first opportunity I had. They gave me three hours. They gave me seven to ten, and I had three. I know. <laughs> we're gonna increments of three. My cousin called me, said, there's a band that's been dropped. They kind of had Lottie Miss Claw. They kind of had a breakout hit. And uh, so I went and saw them. Okay, so 
and through through I'll never forget this because I, I was so young I couldn't get in Blackrock. I mean I, I wear a suit and a tie to get in the door. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, so the first opportunity was don't you don't you care? Mm -hmm. Okay, kind of a drag hadn't been released. It was they released it after it was announced they were signing with me at Columbia. But uh, Charlie Colello, and Charlie was one of the Four Seasons who I had been on the road with. Charlie Colello, mm -hmm. and his father was a contractor. So I I cut the basic track. And I'll never forget Gene Weiss was head of promotion before he says, okay, we're giving you a chance. You only got two, you got two three hour sessions. And this is my last thing I'm going to say in this. <laughs> he said, I want you to know what it takes to make a hit. And I'm going like, oh, <laughs> yes. He, he said, when I come in tomorrow morning, it better have there's only two things that make a hit in this business, hummability and tapability. And I'm going, I'm a bit. <laughs> <laughs> And I go, would you elaborate on that? You know, what is, and he said, in the first, I better be singing it all the way home on the subway, and in the first eight bars, I better be tapping my damn foot. So when you hear the bucky, everything was. I started with the drum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that's that was how my career. I love that we we covered Buckingham's. You know, Buckingham's it, nice kids. It was great music. But see, yeah, I but, didn't. In those days, they were very sensitive if you didn't let them play. Yeah. See, so I rehearsed them, but I'm playing the guitar and the bass on those records. And they had a horn section, right? Or did yeah, they? Well, Charlie Colello. Yeah. I put the horns. I wrote all the charts and did it in one night. Came in the next morning, that was it. Hummability. Then Kind ability. of a Drag came out. Kind of a Drag came out right after we had signed. So it had already started. So you, you always had a, a love see, for on horns. Mercy, Mercy, that's Johnny Garren. The only records they played on were they played, Hey Baby, they're playing our song, mm -hmm. Susan, Rhythm Section. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And Don't You Care. We had like four or five hits in a row. Yeah. So, so like I said, you always had a, a love for the horns then. So it was kind of a natural for you to do oh, yeah. Chicago. He said but th that uh, I think it was um, an English duo that came over. Um, Chad and Jeremy were on a Dick Clark tour, mm -hmm. and I was in the band. But I ended up understanding the, I, had, I, I could write, I wrote the charts. Mm -hmm. A lot of people showed up, they had, I mean, I had the record chart, you know. So I, I got most of the black tours when I started out because I could write the charts. And I wanted to see the world. I don't want to interrupt any. So anyway, Chad and Jeremy were one of the acts. Um, I kind of had had it with, I had been on a couple tours, worked my way up to the A band. And one of the Zombies was maybe the last tour, one of the last tours. Um, but uh, the road manager, I had, I made about I made $107 a week and paid for the hotel and the food, so I didn't sleep in many hotel rooms. Mm -hmm. I would sleep on the bus or I'd sneak in and take a shower. Mm -hmm. But anyway, what's we were in between tours. We'd get to a city for two days. You have all the action. I'd do all the charts, rehearse. It was a big band, you know. But I was going back to college. It was August or September would have been 64 or something like that. And when I, and I had given him notice, Dick and I were tight. This was, this guy's name was Ed McAdams. He was a road manager, ex-Marine, did not like me. I'm, he says, you will never work in this business again. <laughs> I'm gonna personally, you can't go back to college. And this is, <laughs> this is fate, this is all fate. And he was so pissed off that he, didn't pull the bus off the freeway. He left me at Central and Belmont, tough neighborhood, north side, and he pulled on the shoulder, and I had to walk up, it's 100 degrees, and I had a showman, a, the amp, one suitcase, and my guitar, and my bass. And I remember having to, I said, I can't leave, this will disappear in 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. So I made four trips up to this phone booth and the end of the story is real brief. Anyway, 
I call my mother. I call home. Oh, you're here. You made it. You're all registered for. Call. There's a guy been calling you. There's a guy calling you all day, and not last night he keeps calling. He's got an English accent. I said, Mom, give me the number. So I'm, and there was no. I remember opening the empty thing with the phone book was gone. And I scratched it. <laughs> I scratched it. And it was Alan Klein. So, uh, so it was Alan Klein. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just telling you my life, and then we'll go on. And yeah. so I, I scratched a number. I call it, and it was uh, Chad Stewart. It might have been. It was Alan Klein's office. And then Chad got on the phone. Where are you? And I said, Well, I ain't gonna be. I just got fired. I just got kicked off the bus. He said, There's a ticket at O'Hare Field at six or seven o'clock. You're at the Warwick Hotel. We got to do The Tonight Show, Joey Bishop, um, and Mike Douglas, I think was in Philadelphia. And one of, and we, we got to do these shows. They had visa problems. Yeah. And he said, and you got to, we got to do it. We're booked, we're doing these TV shows. We need you. And so I go home and my mother picked me up and I said, mom, I got to go to New York. <laughs> She started crying. I said, no, no, I'm going to college. I'm, I'm gonna go. But I, I need $200. I can't go to New York. I mean, you know, so I got $200 out of the college fund. And I never went home. <laughs> I mean, it was just fate. So but, I knew that. When you talk about Chad and Jeremy, I don't know if Jimmy story. doesn't know, but they knew Chad and Jeremy because yeah. I wrote their, I wrote a hit called Distant Shores. And I, anyway, they got their, they came, they got their visas taken care of mm -hmm. and they came back and I got word because uh, the hotel, I only had four days. It was only three or four days paid for and they paid me like 300 bucks. It was a lot of money. Anyway, Kenny, Denver. No, no, that's a great story, man. So you, um, you were original member of Barn. Of Barnstorm. Yeah. Yeah, with Joe. Yeah. And, and how, how did that happen? You know, it was a telephone call from Tommy Bolin. I was, uh, because I could read music and I could triple, I played, trump I was a classical trumpet player as a child and I was playing bass and singing and I was uh, doing session work in Vancouver. <clears throat> and I got a call from Tommy, he says, listen, this guy, Joe Walsh, quit the James Gang and he's moved to Nederland, Colorado with his wife and child and he's looking for a bass player and I recommended you and and at this point I remember I was listening to Surf's Up and Tommy and I had already gone to New York and you know I was thinking you know Funk 49 that's you know I don't know about that and he says no you got to take the call and that's how it started uh, Joe called me I flew down to uh, Denver drove my dad's car because I'm from Denver Colorado mm -hmm. originally I drove up to, to Netherland and it met Joe, and, and that was the beginning of it. And, and then our first song, I mean, our first I was hit, building the studio. He was building it wasn't the studio. Finished. Right. I mean, that's the connection was here. The Hayloft was finished, but I was right. waiting for a board. We never got the board. But didn't the, didn't y'all have trouble with the studio you were at? And, and well, what it was is it was Joe had, here's, he's up in Nederland, Colorado, you know, about 10, 15 miles away from, from Jim's house and studio and he had a 24 track in his basement and it blew something blue bill simsick said uh, who was joe's producer and our producer Tumble at that time record. he called he called uh, jim he says you know what i think jim gershio's building a studio up here and that's how that's how we ended up there and the first it, record out of the, the first one was rocky mountain way that well the first hit but we Barnstorm. brought in a little tea i said bill i don't have any equipment oh. We got a great room. It's all wired mics. We're oh, yeah. waiting for the board. He says, I'll get one. Yeah, it's true. It was So it was Rocky there. Mountain Way was on a... A little... Th yeah. It was yeah. A, it was he a, got... I can't, Bill will tell you. Wasn't it a TAC? It was a TAC, I think. A real funky I, I little board. I can't remember. Wow. But, uh, Bill's a great engineer, man. That's there was where, no that's bathroom. Yeah, there was, there was no... There was horse stalls. Yeah, there were yeah, horse I heard, stalls. I heard there, there was still... In horse stalls. Fresh there was no bathrooms. horse manure on the. No, no, we were peeing in the <laughs> stalls. Downstairs. This is, yeah, I just, yeah, I just yeah, had yeah. enough money to do the hayloft. Yeah. No, yeah. you got up to that second floor and it was like, whoa, it was beautiful. Yeah, it was the it second was floor, so we put a lot in. So did you buy the property the first or did you. or had, Yeah, yeah. So. It took a long time. Transamerica was going to develop it 
3,000 homes, golf courses. But half of it was owned by an oil company, and I had a friend, and it took about three years. 71 is when I closed the deal, October, started the studio. So when did you record, 72? 72. 72 I mean, was yeah, the finish. Yeah, we were the, that was the beginning, the Barnstorm record, and yeah. then Rocky Mountain Way was the laughter. So how did you, um, how did you end up playing with, on the, with Elton John? Well, again, it was, <laughs> here's, here's a bizarre story. Uh, after I, Barnstorm broke up in 74. I had been offered a gig with Stephen Stills. Matter of fact, I did a tour with Manassas. Mm -hmm. Well, Stephen, they recorded Manassas. Yeah, Manassas was, up, was right. up at the ranch. Yeah. So, and I met Stephen when I was 19. He, and uh, I heard the acetate of the CSN record mm -hmm. in Gold Hill, Colorado. Somebody, there was a uh, guy, uh, Happy Logan, in, in Denver said, Stephen Stills, do you know Steve, Steve Stills? And I said, sure, are you, are you kidding? Buffalo, Springfield, I heard him. They came through Denver and Super Session. And he says, well, he's looking for a bass player and I recommended you. So I drove up to Gold Hill and uh, I'll never forget when the door opened in this little Victorian house, it was cold as hell, it was like February of 1969. And there's Stephen looking exactly like he looks on the CSN record. He's got his hiking boots and his little button-down shirt and v-neck. And he, he says, come, come in. And he says, you've been recommended. And tiny little stereo, almost like the JFK one you have here. Yeah. And he puts on an acetate of the CSN record. And I'll never forget. Do, 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 do. Oh. Changed my life. Yeah. So I met Stephen then. He says, listen, you, you know, we hung out and played. And he says, you know, here's my manager, his name's David Geffen. We're gonna do something called Woodstock or something. I don't know anything about it, but it's gonna be our first gig. It didn't work out. Neil Young had a guy named, named uh, Greg Reeves mm -hmm. that he met at the Motown. So I didn't get that gig. So fast forward to 71, Manassas moves to Boulder, Colorado. I'm playing with, with Joe, but Stevens, I idolize Steven. And well, he's a great guitar player. He's a great yeah. bass player too. You know, he's a great, I well, mean, love, a, love the one you're Steve's with. Good. That's, I mean, CSN that's Steve. record. CSN Steve's underrated record. as a musician. Yeah. A tremendous he, player. Engineer, he could do it all. I mean, yeah. that CSN record, that's all Steven. Well, well, one of my all-time favorite records, I probably wore out every way you could make the from cassette to eight track to vinyl, whatever, uh, was Deja Vu was. Oh, Deja Vu, Deja killer, Vu. man. Yeah. That was, yeah, well, that was. Later on, Stephen says, in 74, um, oh, let, me, let me go back to Joe Walsh. Manassas, Joe uh, Walsh decides we finish the Dan Fogelberg record. Okay, Joe has decided. Joe produced it. Uh, Joe produced the, the Souvenirs oh, wow. record. Wow. At the ranch. Well, yeah. He, yeah. So Joe says, listen, I'm going to, he, he was making a life choice change in his life, and he met another gal, and he says, I'm, I'm going to break up Barnstorm. I want you to come with me to L.A. And uh, I said, sure, Joe. And I <laughs> go home to my parents' house in Denver, and I call up Stephen. I said, man, do I still have that gig offer? Because uh, he'd offered me the gig before, and I said, I can't leave Joe. You know, we've been doing this for two years. So he hired Barnstorm open for Manassas. We did a whole summer tour. And, and I says, is the gig still on? And he's, I said, I don't want to, the band's breaking up. And he says, you got it. So I uh, called Irving Azoff. Yeah. And I said, Irving, I'm not coming to L.A. And he says, well, I said, can you tell Joe? And he says, no, you have to call him. <laughs> so I called, he was in Big Sur with his new girlfriend. And I called him and I said, Joe, you know, I, I, I love Colorado. I'm, I'm here at Caribou. I want to stay, stay in Colorado. And, and he was cool. He says, okay, do what you got to do. But I thought, well, I burned that bridge. So a couple years later, I played with Stephen. I, would, I was offered the tour to do the 74 tour with CSNY, but I went to rehearse with them at Neil's, but Neil had Neil Tim, had his own Neil had Tim Drummer. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, and plus, Neil and Stephen, it was always a competition. Butchery was there then, weren't it? Yeah, yeah, right, right. So in Russ Kunkel, you know, there's all these, mm -hmm. all these people. So it didn't work out, and uh, I went off to do something else, and I get this call. It's Joe Walsh. He says, hey, listen, uh, 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 I'm with Elton John, and 
David Foster and Elton's firing his band. He's firing Dee and Nigel, and he wants to hire you. He's heard, because I was playing fretless bass. Right. He says he likes your sound, and he loves what you did on the Rick Derringer mm -hmm. record that was done mm -hmm. at Caribou. Simsic. Simsic produced that. And, and I said, are you kidding me? And I said, really? And he says, yeah. So that's, it was through Joe Walsh. And uh, that, was, that was the beginning of my work with, with Elton. And, and I get a call from, first management calls me, Connie Pappas. And she says, well, I says, is this for real? And she, I said, could you get Elton on the phone for me <laughs> to make sure this isn't some kind of like BS? And Elton says, here's the deal. We're going to rehearse uh, a month in Amsterdam. And then we're doing our first gig at Wembley Stadium which he played with the Beach Boys. Wow. He played bass. It was, it was Joe, uh, Rufus, Joe Walsh, before he joined, Eagle. the Eagles, Beach Boys, and Elton John, and we did Captain Fantastic. But because of his insistence, <laughs> the Beach Boys did five encores before we got on there, and people were looking at their watches uh -huh. and yawning by the time we got on there. He blew well, us off the stage. Well, it wasn't It was just, it was 100,000 people. <laughs> yeah, well, sure. Yeah. <laughs> And the Beach Boys are competitive. Oh, the we Beach no Boys! The DL Beach Boys were the Beatles. In, right. in, we had a in hell London. of a show. Yeah, hey, it's a great we're, show. We're gonna take a we're gonna take a break, and we'll okay. be right back.